thanks for joining everybody the patch my pc webinar um today we'll be talking about the, the microsoft graph api and using the microsoft graph sdk so it's gonna be some good fun uh, we're gonna go through some different concepts and terminologies tiny bit of powerpoint but mostly just sitting in some code and just showing some stuff um, in enter id so it should be a really fun session hopefully uh, we're, we're going to go deep in some areas maybe keep it level two to 300 so um, it appeals to most of the audience um, but yeah hopefully we should have fun um, i'm joined today by cody hey cody hello there hey so we're gonna we're gonna have a fun i think we've probably got about an hour's worth of content give or take depends um how much we talk really <laughs> and how much we die through code so we're really just going to focus on some high level concepts as we go through the powerpoint so we're going to talk a little bit about what is the microsoft graph it's always good to understand the topic and we're about to share some technical stuff about um we'll talk about what a rest api is just to give those who don't really know what it is some familiarity um, we'll talk about authentication and authorization um, so this is something that's often misunderstood and when we talk about that we'll also talk about scopes and what is a scope and how do they apply when we're looking at a delegated auth flow what do they mean um, some of these topics as well on authentication and authorization we'll talk more about as we go through some code examples and walk you through enter id as well so if you think well hey man that's pretty light on content in the powerpoint and um, that's purposeful because <laughs> we don't want to spend ages in powerpoint um, and then like the main reason today is we're going to talk about the graph SDK. We're going to use some SD, graph SDK commands, talk about why the SDK is good, talk about why maybe you wouldn't want to use the SDK and use some native calls to the graph instead. And so most of the time we're going to spend it in the lab. So we'll start off by just calling out um, what is the Microsoft graph. And really, it's been around for quite a few years now. Um, I think most people are familiar with the term if you're working in the end, Azure Entra Intune space. Um, so really, the graph, um, if you think about it as a single endpoint, so it's a REST API. Um, it exposes multiple REST APIs in the background and client libraries. And every time you access a, a Microsoft 365 service, whether that's Office 365, Teams, um, Intune, um, you're going to be hitting the graph API through a client app. And that client app could be a browser, that could be Outlook. So it's a unified single endpoint that all communication comes into um, that exposes all of those other REST APIs in the background. Um, so before the graph endpoint, really, um, admins use multiple um, different APIs to talk to. So if you use an Exchange admin and use the Exchange Online Management um, PowerShell module, you're connecting to the Outlook.office.com API endpoint. Um, if you're connecting to SharePoint, you'd connect to a different endpoint and you'd maybe have a different PowerShell module for this. So really Microsoft just tried to unify everything into this single endpoint. And to be honest, I think it works pretty well. If if you've um if you're here today, just like I really want to dig into graph, I really want to learn the fundamentals. Um and some of the the, the keywords and buzzwords we use today might not be familiar. Have a look at um graph.microsoft.com. Um so graph.microsoft.com, I'm just going to play a video here just to show you how to get to it. <laughs> um, there's a link on here for fundamentals for graph, like really cool place to start learning about the graph. Um, but yeah, add that to your one thing, uh One thing that's good to note about graph, the Microsoft graph, right, is that's Microsoft uh, consolidated in everything for you, right? Uh, they're they're taking everything and presenting you a set of endpoints. There still are backend services for all of these, right? They they have internal Intune graphs, internal Azure or uh, you know Exchange graph APIs that are getting leveraged as part of this, right? They're they're presenting you a set of endpoints to consolidate it all. So there are different infrastructures and different sets of teams that are working on all of these. Uh, you might have put in a support ticket. At some point, and you know, you you went down the wrong rabbit hole of clicks, and like, sorry, yeah, I know it's graph, but you actually have to talk to this team. Uh, and there's some nuances to all of it for sure. So it's it's changed over time, but I think it's largely changed for the better, uh, to the extent that they can at this kind of scale. Yeah, one hundred percent. Um. Yes, yeah, but on, and so like when we when we talk about the graph, we really want to talk about how we interact with it. Um, and it's just the same way you'd interact with any REST API, really. Um, so the graph supports common HTTP CRUD methods. So create, um, replace, update, delete. So again, these may be 
um, word you're familiar with. So uh, one method might be get, where we, we're going to communicate with the Microsoft Graph API to get some data. Um, so in here, we're talking about reading a data from a resource. And, and that's known as an idempotent request. So when you do a get request, you're always going to get back the same data. Um, we can do posts where we can create a new resource or perform an action. Um, when you do a post to the Microsoft Graph, it's non-item potent. So you're always going to be posting something different. Um, it's going to end up as something different in the graph anyway. It could be a different content version. Um, we can do patch commands where we update an existing resource or just some specific values on a resource. Um, put, we'll replace a resource entirely in the Microsoft Graph, and we'll show some examples on that. And then delete as well, where we remove a resource. And whenever you're kind of working with all these APIs, these are standards, you know, it's, it's up to whoever is presenting you these to, to kind of follow those standards. Uh, there's a bunch of ISO standards and fund numbers and, and things like that, that define what these should look like. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, you, you can commonly make these do whatever you want. Um, you know, a, a post can have no body at all and return data to you. It doesn't matter. Uh, but, when you are developing these or when you're working uh, with these, there are some things you'll definitely want to keep in mind. Uh, you know, For example, one thing we note there is that a get doesn't have a body, uh, but that doesn't mean you can't provide any info to a get. Uh, if you've ever, and we'll do some of these queries in here, right? You're going to do some get requests where you still provide something, maybe a filter, or you still provide some other little piece of information. Maybe it's a sort by property or something. And it's in the, it's in the, it's in the URI, it's in the browser URL. Uh, so a thing that I like to point out is that that information is freely kind of floating out there, right? It's, it doesn't matter that you're using an HTTPS connection if you're doing these get and delete commands and everything's in the URI. Uh, that's completely inspectable. There's nothing encrypting that or anything at all. So, you know, if you're working against one of these or if you're developing one or something, keep that in mind. You know, the, the larger bits of content or important things, those are supposed to either be in your headers or sitting in your body with those post patch and put. So, you know, something we'll kind of show as we go through too is there's different ways to present data to these APIs. And it's it, there's standards, but they don't have to follow them. So you're going to get different responses. I think we've got a couple different things, right? You might get a 400 bad request or a 413 payload too large. Uh, you might get a 429 too many requests. There's a lot of ways that it can respond. There's ways it's supposed to respond, but you got to play with it a little bit sometimes. Yeah, definitely. Um, one of the things we called out, so when, we, when we're using Graph, this is interesting. So when you're doing a maybe a, a post command or you're sending a file attachment to the graph, there is a limit to the size of the thing you can send, which is four megs. Um, so just be co conscious of that. Um, we just call out there in the blue text that's not very easy to read, so sorry. Um, but if, if you were to send a file, there is a base 64 encoding over, overhead that gets applied um, to that data as well. So you probably your file size might be limited to maybe three and a half megs or so by the time you've got the base 64 encoding around it. And as Cody said, like if the file's too large when you're posting it, then you're going to get something like a 413 payload to large response, depending on the endpoint you're hitting, really. <clears throat> so this is kind of, I guess this is like the common the common language we use to speak to an API. These are the methods that we talk about. And so we, we need to make a decision on what method we, we want to use. And we'll talk about that when we go through the code examples. Then we also talk about the endpoint as well. Um, and the endpoint... Um, a developer would, would, would maybe have like a version one publicly supported endpoint, and they might have a beta endpoint, which is where they're testing stuff. And this is exactly what the Microsoft Graph API has. So version one includes the generally, generally available APIs from Microsoft. Um, those APIs will not change or break. There'll be no, um, you won't come in to work tomorrow and your SDK commands will stop working. They're generally long, well-lived. And if there's going to be any deprecation on those or retirement, uh, Microsoft normally publicize them ahead of time. Um, and then the beta endpoint is just where they're, they're testing stuff. Typically, it's it's called a preview um, endpoint and stuff could change at the last minute. However, you'll find as you start to work with, with the graph, um, some of the really cool, important data is on the beta endpoint. So you'll see... In a lot of examples, when you're looking at code samples, um, that the beta endpoint is used to call data. Like a, a typical example, if, if you used to 
do a get um, method to an endpoint that would bring back user information. If you use the version one endpoint, you just get back a small subset of data. If you use the beta endpoint, you get a whole load more data back. So even though we say like the beta is something, just be cautious that it could change without notice. Um, Microsoft use it in production. <laughs> so it's good enough for them. Uh, yeah, good. the fun there is whenever you're doing a support case, they'll uh, commonly look, does it reproduce in V1? And you have to, maybe it'll not be working in, in beta and they will absolutely have you reproduce the exact same thing in, in V1. Uh, and, and the goal with these versions is that, you know, once it's in place, it should be backwards compatible. You, you cannot, you should not introduce a breaking change. If something worked on V1, uh, that, that payload should at least serialize as what it did. It should not go backwards in any way, shape or form. So if some property is there, it can't be removed. Uh, it, you can add properties, but you cannot change things. You cannot change the, the response. You know, that's, that's really bad practice when it comes to an API, uh, especially something publicly available. Yeah, and I guess you have to be, you have to think about kind of everybody's working at different speeds. So you, you may be like something funny called it in chat that Intune itself has been in test since production, since it was introduced. It's quite funny. Um, but if you think about how developers work, so um, the, the graph API is being developed and, and the backend services are always being checked to see whether they're optimal and they work with the graph API, you know, are the endpoints speaking to each other correctly? And then you've got the front end developers developing the, um, the software we're looking at. So it could be the Intune admin center. And it could be that um, all of the really cool stuff that they want to build really cool stuff is only exposed through the beta endpoint. And they haven't really done enough stress testing on the beta endpoint to move it into V1. So you could see the beta endpoint being used for months and months and months because developers want to expose all the really cool stuff to the customers. You know, I get that. People want to sell um, the software. But yeah, it's just interesting to see. Okay, so we said we weren't going to spend ages in PowerPoint. Um, so... How do we interact with the graph? Um, there's some really cool tools out there. Um, Postman's a really cool tool um, to connect to the graph API. Um, graph Explorer is a really great place to start if you've not used it before. And we're going to just show a brief example of how to use the graph explorer. SDKs, that's the reason we're here today. Um, Microsoft have multiple SDKs to interact with the Microsoft graph. We're going to specifically be talking about the PowerShell SDK today, because we're all PowerShell fans. Um, do you use the graph.net SDK, Cody? The... Uh, yeah, we do. We, we use the graph. It yeah. uh, We've done projects with it, and we've done projects without it, and <laughs> interacted with graph. So it makes things a little bit easier. You're subject to uh, you know the, those packages updating. There's been times where we've started to work against the, the beta APIs uh, where the endpoints are there, and the metadata has changed, the new classes are available, but the SDK is not updated yet, right? Yeah. So. We'll we'll go in and make our own bits and pieces to start interacting with that. Yeah, it's one of the as we go through this webinar, we're talking about like why would I use the SDK and you know why don't I just use native invoke REST method and talk to the API and like well, game on, do that. Um, I mean, it, if I was to be asked, do you want to use the SDK or not use the SDK? I think I'd probably swing towards the not use the SDK camp. Um, right. But there are some real good advantages for using the SDK to abstract away some of the complexities like managing tokens. And so they're some of the things we're going to call out. Um, and then, of course, the last option there is you can just use the REST method natively. Call the API um, from PowerShell. Curl. Cool. <clears throat> um, so as we go through today, some of the samples we'll show you, um, there's a particular structure to the way we uh, communicate with the graph. Um, so we spoke about the different CRUD methods that we use. And so this is how the request is built. We have a method. We have the endpoint that we want to communicate with, which we've just talked about. And then we have the actual resource itself. You know, So where do we want to talk to? Do we want to talk to Intune? Do we want to talk to um, Enter ID and have a look at groups? So if you think about this nice three-step structure, this is a good way to um, think about how to communicate with the graph. Um, so yeah, Graph Explorer, really great place to start. Um, if you've not done anything with the Graph API before, so aka.ms slash GE, you'll you'll get to the Graph Explorer page as seen here. If you do not log into that, you can still interact with the graph. Um, you'll just be using sample data. So if you've ever spun up a, a Microsoft tenant just to do some testing, um, you'll often see Megan Bowen um, swimming around as you do some graph requests. So Megan is just a, a 
hypothetically I don't know if Megan's a real person. Megan might be a real person. I don't know. I don't want to disservice her. Um, but these are all sample data. So don't, don't go to use Graph Explorer, hit the run query, and then think, well, who's Megan? Megan doesn't work for me. Um, if you sign in, you'll then be accessing your tenant data, depending on the permissions you have. You know, we'll talk about that as we go through this. Um, so nearly the end of the slides, we just want to touch really on authentication and authorization. Um, you've maybe heard these shortened to auth n and auth z. Um, they are pretty important. Um, not so if you're in the lab just testing the graph API, but as a concept, it's really good to understand what they both mean. And um, we're going to share this deck afterwards. So really, if you think about authentication being you proving your identity to um, your IDP, your enter ID. Um, so you're essentially saying, my name's Ben. Um, I'm proving who I am because here's my uh, credentials. That's essentially what you're doing with authentication. Once you authenticate um, to your authentication provider, um, you're going to get your token. Authorization is really the next part. So once you've been identified, um, you're then going to be authorized. You know, what actually can this person access? Like, can Cody access the full graph in my tent? Can Cody create groups? Can Cody create virtual machines in Azure and, you know, run my credit card below the ceiling? And, you know, when we think about authorization, we hopefully have a really well planned and designed um, approach to it back in our tenant. So we're only giving people permissions to do the necessary things they need to do their job. Like we're not giving everybody global admin, for example. So really, that's what we're talking about authorization. Is this user who's been authenticated allowed to do the thing they want to do? We add a slight level of complexity onto that when we talk about scopes. And we're going to try and talk about scopes now because <clears throat> they're interesting. So scopes is cheese. So everybody at Patch My PC knows I'm a bit of a cheese fan. Um, so if you think about, so let's let's say that person in the picture is Scott uh, Patch My PC because he looks a bit Scottish. So Scott's there, he's walking into the cheese shop and he's got a cheese ticket that allows him um, to go into the cheese shop. So Scott presents his ticket to the cheese shop owner and says, hey, um, I've got a ticket to come and get cheese. And then the, the owner of the cheese shop will look at the ticket and say, okay, um, you can come in. Um, and then Scott goes, great. Okay, I want some gorgonzola. And then the shopkeeper looks at the ticket and says, well, no, you're not allowed gorgonzola. You know, it's, it's not on your ticket. <laughs> so you're not in scope to have gorgonzola. So this is what scopes really... Um, Please don't go away thinking scopes are cheese. They're not. <laughs> uh, but a scope is essentially, um, this is what a client application is allowed to do on my user's behalf. Yeah. So I could say in, in a real world example, um, I'm going to authenticate um, and I want to access this particular resource in the graph. So maybe I want to access my mailbox. Am I scoped? Do I have the scope? permission to view the mailbox so that's one aspect like am i allowed to use this client app um, am i scoped to actually access the mailbox but then i also need permission on the mailbox as well i need permission on the on the resource to do the thing so scoping is saying scott is allowed to buy gorgonzola um, but he also needs his ticket to say he has permission to buy gorgonzola as well um, I thought cheese was going to be a great way to make this sound easier, but I've probably done a disservice to it and made it more complicated. You made a really nice picture, though. I, I can see that there's oh. been some edits to this. It's, it looks Certainly like... chat GPT. Oh, it said U U U T H too. So I had yeah. to change it to an A. But that took me all night. Oh, it's good. And so uh, with the authorization and authentication, uh, if you've worked in some of the other parts of of you know, information technology, you might have ran into AAA, right? The, the other part of this is accounting. Uh, it's it's obfuscated from us when we're working with graph, uh, especially because the accounting part, the audit part, that that chain of custody, that that logging, that's all already happening for us. Uh, so, you know, I'm guessing that there's a receipt that's going to happen as part of this cheese interaction here. And, and that's our paper trail. That's our accounting aspect as well. And we can kind of take that for granted. Microsoft's doing all that wonderful stuff for us. But at the end of the day, you're going to want to know who was authorized to do, who authenticated and what were they authorized to do and when did they do it? Uh, and, and that kind of all comes together. You've got that token that helps you uh, be identified. And that's going to also tell you what were you able to do 
And then it's up to you to do the accounting of what you actually did to add that additional logging. And that's what the graph takes care of for you. Yeah. And we'll see, um, we'll see scopes in action today. So we'll see um, a scope is an application. If we think about it in the delegated all flow. So the scope is saying um, this application is to do this thing on behalf of the user. The user still needs permission in the resource to do that thing. Um, so when we talk about application permissions, it could be like, even if we think outside of the graph and the SDK and the wonderful PowerShell world we're in, um, you could think of it like Facebook having access to your photos. So you may have seen you, you go in Facebook and Facebook might pop up and says, can I have access to your photos? That's basically a grant request. So it's there's a scope request to access your data and you're granting consent for Facebook to access your photos. So it's a similar vein. Um, when we're looking at the code we're going to be looking at today. <clears throat> so we, we're going to maybe spend more time um, looking at authentication and the ways to authenticate using the SDK. Um, so we are going to spend a lot of time looking at delegated access. Um, so we're going to be use, using some interactive authentication scenarios, um, device code flow, and UI-based interactive via the browser. And so this is the authentication part. Um, we'll talk about um, enterprise app service principles and so when we where we where do we define scopes and where is that scoped information saved uh, we'll also then look at application access as well so we we have to have an application um, to talk to the graph and that could be an app registration it could be a public application um, in the microsoft store it could be facebook um, but we'll talk about how can we have the application directly accessing the graph so it's not doing a delegated flow on behalf of the user. And so typically in those scenarios, we would have to have a credential. We'd have to define a credential for the application. Um, and so we'd use a secret or a certificate and we'll show you examples of how to do that. Um, and if we've got time, we'll talk about managed identities. Like they've been around for a while as well. They're the things to use. If you're doing any kind of automation in Azure, um, you don't really want to be having to worry about um, grant flows and secrets and certificates you'll just use the identity um the cert the identity of the service principle and um, we'll talk about that um, i don't want to spoil the fun um so here's some like 101 um things you should know so you really should be considering who who can sign into your applications okay so when you start off by using graph sdk um, if you're not using your own client app to make the calls to graph and you're just doing connect mg graph and we'll look at that in a second um, you're going to be connecting via a service principle that will already exist in your tenant so there's an enterprise application slash service principle called the microsoft graph command line tools so anybody using the sdk to talk to graph um, are going to have to grant permissions for this application to do the thing um, on their behalf and so you maybe don't want everybody in your organization just downloading the SDK and making calls um, to the graph. Like, I mean, they're going to have to grant permission for this app to do the thing for them, but they still can't do anything beyond what permissions they have to do in a directory, okay? Um, but sometimes it's good just to restrict access because sometimes you look at these apps and if you go in your tenant now and look at the graph command line tools, um, if you look at the permissions that have been granted to this um, service principle, you might see loads of users have given permissions for this app to do something on their behalf. You might be thinking, well, that's okay, because um, it can't do anything over and above the permission they have in the directory. But this is a trusted app. This is a, a Microsoft app. It's a trusted publisher. And we'll talk about enterprise app security, and your users might be consenting to apps um, that, or maybe requesting permissions to send mail on their behalf, yeah? And so I could go out and write a dodgy app today. Um, I could spam email your users and say, hey, look, you've won a car, click on this link. Do you, I need to send you an email, click on this link, and then I've got access to send email on their behalf. So we're gonna talk a little bit about um, enterprise app security. So maybe think about who can sign in and out of these um, apps. If you restrict access, um, so you only, you explicitly saying who can log in and who can log out via these service principles, you'll get something like this come back if you try to log in, where the administrator has blocked the user. When you're actually in Entra, you want to go to enterprise applications and you must review this. Like if you haven't seen this in the last three months in your tenant, go and look at it today. Um, by default, all new tenants will have a very low threshold of security for enterprise apps. And so it's going to allow all allow users to, to consent for apps. So the dodgy app, 
Yeah, the user clicks on the dodgy app. They consent to the app to send the email on their behalf. You're in a world of trouble. So you really want to think about what you're allowing users to grant permissions on. So do not allow user consent is very restrictive. Um, you know, we want to be flexible. We want people to use all the cool apps that are out there, but as long as we trust them. So the middle option is a nice sweet spot. Allow user consent for apps from verified publishers, okay? And only apps that require very low permissions. Things like read the user's profile or read the user's email address. So um, if we have time, we might we might go through that in the lab. Um, but if, if the user tries to request if the user's granting permission um, for an application to do something on their behalf and it's highly permissive and you've restricted that them from doing that, um, you can grant an admin consent request. And so this is what this would look like. So um, I've, in this example, I've said that users cannot consent to anything. So every time an application asks a user, hey, can I do this thing on your behalf? Um, the user has to ask an admin. So they have to give a justification and, and the admin will be notified, hey, Ben wants to access this app that can send mail on his behalf. Do you want to allow that? And I'd probably say no. So yeah, we'll we'll jump into some enterprise app security. And so the last couple of slides on what is the Graph SDK. The Graph SDK provides pre-built methods to interact with the graph and it abstracts away much the complexity that comes with using native REST API calls. I think I chat GPT that. That doesn't sound like me. Um, SDKs generally try to make things easier for you and generally they do until you want to start doing some more advanced stuff um and we'll we'll show some examples as we go through this um there's a link there if you access the resources in zoom you'll see a link there to have a look at all the sdks there's loads of them we're going to be looking at the powershell one specifically and here's like here's an example of why the sdk is really cool like on the left hand the, side sorry uh the the one interesting thing with the SDK is that a lot of it is generated by Microsoft based on mm -hmm. metadata. Uh, so you get some comically long commands sometimes because based on what the, the endpoints all are and, and where it navigates down the graph, it'll auto-generate these insanely long commandlets and, and things for you. But uh, it's, it's nice because you get some consistency between all the different platforms. If you take this SDK and you do decide to load it up in, in C-sharp or PowerShell or Go or something, uh, they, they all behave you know, functionally identically. Uh, you're going to get the same behavior, the same methods, the same classes and objects um, or whatever you're interacting with, which is nice. Um, but you know, when, when it's messed up in one area, it's kind of messed up everywhere. Uh, but it's a, it's a lot to maintain. So I guess I get that they're generating it. Yeah. And like, it's really there for simplicity. So the example here is if I was using a native REST API method, um, I would have to do the token handling myself. And I'd maybe have to worry about once I get the access token, what happens when it expires? Do I have to reauthenticate? Do I need to worry about the um, refresh token? How do I manage that? And you have to think about all these things as you're writing your code. And sometimes the SDK just handles that for you. So the authentication is really simple. Um, it handles the refresh tokens for you, giving you new access tokens if you need them. Um, really good at handling pagination for results coming back from the graph as well. So I think um, let's jump into it. That's enough PowerPoint. Um, there's, a, there's a link in the resources, all the code we're gonna show today, we've anonymized it. So I've taken out all my client secrets for my lab. And so you can access that on our GitHub. There's a picture of our GitHub. Right, let me share, let me go into VS Code. Maybe a bit down the rabbit hole, but uh, it is possible to even generate your own uh, SDKs from Microsoft's metadata too, which is pretty neat. They've got some docs on uh, the tool they use, Kyoto, that will let you generate your own packet packages here. So you could actually maybe generate your own based off like a small subset. Maybe you only need 10 commands or something. You can generate your own too. So, you know. Is there an option to allow all scopes, uh, for example, connect with graph, scopes all, or or asterisks or something? Um, I wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> Um, you, you, but we'll go, as we show the code, we'll show you how to define scopes as you go. So you really should be starting with like least privileged and, um, allowing, um, increasing the scope as you need it, depending on your application requirements. Um, now the good thing, well, the interesting thing about scopes, so we're in the delegated flow, you're granting permission for the application to do something on the user behalf. And once that's been granted, that's it. It's granted. 
So um, that's there for life until you revoke that permission. So if I grant users.readall, it's there. Um, I don't really need to define that in the scope again when I'm reconnecting to graph because that exists. And we'll show you in the in the demo how you can see what permissions are on the graph. Yeah, I, I mean, there's there's some good comments that I think are pretty relevant here. Someone mentioned that they use you know graph uh, API access as as a red team. Um, you know, this is, uh, it's up to you what you allow, what permissions are you setting and granting consent for. You have to be mindful of the implications of these these awesome buttons that you're clicking that make things so easy. Um, you know, they, they can be pretty dangerous. You can grant a lot of access. You can grant a lot of implied access that you didn't realize. Uh, yeah, it, it's something to be mindful of. Um, you know, there, there's a huge security risk and consideration when you start to expose these. Uh, there, there are ways to determine what kind of access you have. There are ways to, you know, enumerate that out and and figure out ways that there is, you know, can you do some lateral movement? So let's go through some code, shall we? And let's try to make some of this stuff real. So we said we were going to show you Graph Explorer just to begin with, just to go over that very briefly. So um, here's the browser I, I prepared earlier. So when you go to aks slash GE, um, it's, it's signed out. Um, if you... Here we got the method, the endpoint, and the resource, and we can just hit run query, and it's going to pull back some sample data. So there's Megan Bowen. If I was to actually sign in now, <clears throat> so what's going on here? We, when we talk about scopes and granting permissions, so it's requesting permissions for me now, which is interesting. Um, so this application wants to do something on behalf of me, so I need to grant that permission. So before I do that, I'm going to cancel that and just show you what this looks like when we look at the service principle. These are really important concepts to understand. So when we look at enterprise applications, uh, let's just search for Graph Explorer. So the Graph Explorer is a service principle in your tenant. The application or the client app actually exists somewhere else in Microsoft tenant. But essentially what you're doing is um, you're, you're going to be giving this application permission to do something on your behalf. And we've already said that you still need permission on that resource to do the thing. So at the moment, this is blank. Your tenant will not be blank. There'll be loads of people in here who have granted consent to when they've been playing with Graph. So nothing here. If we were to go back to Graph Explorer and let's sign in again. Graph Explorer is going to want to know who I am um, so it can request access to resources on my behalf. So I'm going to accept this. They're pretty low permissions. It just wants to read my profile. So I'm signed in. By default, um, I've got permissions to view my own profile. And if I hit the run query, you can now see I'm authenticated to view this resource via the Graph API. Right, so if we jump back to the Enterprise app now and just do a refresh here, you'll see under the User Consent tab, one user has granted admin consent for all this service principle to do something on their behalf, and that's me. So this is how this thing works. You might have tons of users in here, and you can see there's not really a very easy way for me to delete permissions that users have granted, not in the UI. So this is something you're going to have to think about. If, if you look at the Graph Explorer service principle, if you look at the service principle for the Graph SDK, um, you may see some stuff on there as well. Users themselves can delete the permission they've granted. So if the user goes to myapps.microsoft.com, as long as you've said that the application is visible um, in the My Apps portal, um, they can go to um, the application. So here's Graph Explorer. If they click the three dots and say manage the application, they'll see the permissions that they have granted to this application. They can go and hit revoke consent. I don't know what situation a user would go in and do this, um, but it's there as a way to delete that consent on the app. So if I revoke it, um, and I just refresh this <clears throat> in a second, this service principle is updated and my my user is going to be binned off of here. Sometimes it takes a few nanoseconds. There you go. So, so if the user tried to access the resource again, um, it's going to request consent again. Now, my token, um, I've already been authorized to access the that request through the token I have, so I can keep on doing these calls all day long while my token's okay. But if I was to sign out here, I should have rebranded my tenant to 
cheese or something before the demo. That would have been much better. So if we sign back in again. Cool. No, thanks, Bit Warden. Um, I have MFA switched on like a good boy. There you go. So it's asking me for permission again because I removed it. Awesome. Okay, but we really want to we limit that. We really want to focus on the SDK. Okay. Um, but graph is a really cool thing to start to learn how to do stuff. Now the SDK is huge. Yeah, if you used to just go say um, install module Microsoft Graph, um, it's it's a big beast, like six and a half thousand commands, like. I generally just install the modules as and when I need them, um, especially if I'm working, if I'm using um, any automation in Azure and I have to actually install the modules on the resource I'm using. I don't want to put the whole the whole graph SDK on there. So just be specific with the modules you need. Um, if you're going to lab, just install the whole thing. That's fine. So in our example today, I just want to do some stuff with the user. So I'm going to install the module um, for graph users and authentication. So it's just telling me it's already installed, which is cool. Okay, so I've got the Graph SDK installed. And the, the first thing I want to really do with the SDK now is do a connection um, and get a token. And really, this is where you want to think about what kind of scopes you're permitting um, that client application to do. So when we're talking about just connecting via the Microsoft Graph SDK natively, and we're using the connect mg graph command, which you'll use a lot. Um, that is using a service principle that already exists in your tenant. There's an enterprise app, um, and that is called the, if we go back to enterprise applications, the Microsoft graph command line tools that used to be called Microsoft graph PowerShell. Um, was it just Microsoft Graph PowerShell or was there something else on it? Can you remember, Cody? I think it still had something else on it. I have it in a tenant. I'll look while you're going. But this is, yeah, this is the service principle. So you can have a look at this and you can see which users have been signing in via the SDK. So look at the permissions. Um, so mine's blank because I reset everything. Um, but yeah, you might be interested to see who's been using the SDK because they're going to have to grant permission through here. So what does that look like then? So if I grant some permissions now, so I'm going to connect to the Microsoft Graph. Um, the user I'm going to connect with is overly permissive, but it has a lot of permissions in the tenant. Um, but I only want this graph application. Um, I want to scope access. I want to limit what I can do or what the what the application can do on my behalf. So I'm going to define the scopes. Now, I've, I've called out here, these are the scopes that will be used anyway the first time you connect via the application. So if I was just to use Connect MG Graph, it's going to use the, the minimal scopes anyway. But these are the ones it's going to use, so I'm just going to call it out. If I just do Connect-MG Graph, um, it's going to do a, an interactive flow. So it's going to pop in a browser and ask me to authenticate. There you go. So I need to grant um, the Graph SDK enterprise application permission to do something on my behalf. So I'm going to say, yeah, you can read my profile information. And the redirect is, is interesting. Um, it's actually really interesting. And I'll talk about the redirect in a second and, and what's going on here. But if I go back to VS Code now, um, so I've done connect to graph. Now I want to just see if that was successful. Um, I can run get MG context. Get that connect to the graph. Oh, there we go. I'll just head it off the screen. So if I run um, get MG context, it's just going to give me some really cool information um, on how I connect to the graph via the SDK. So you can see it's a delegated auth flow. Um, so I granted the application permission. Um, and these are the scopes that were used. And it was an interactive login via the browser. So it's pretty cool. Okay. So 
next step so i've made the connection that's really simple so all that all that token confusion and complexity has been abstracted away from me completely so now i can run another command um called get mg user so i can run that just to pull back some information about me as a user and so get mg user and it's pulled back some information so that's pretty cool so authentication was really quick um not too complex and we've pulled back some information already now, don't forget, um, I'm going to walk through this really slowly on purpose, yeah? So the next command I want to try is I've authorized the application um, to do very basic things, and it's only got access to my profile. So what happens now if I try to view another user data? Any guesses? So it's actually come back and said, sorry, Ben, you're not allowed to do that. You're not authorized, yeah? So I've not been, I've not given the application um, scope to look at other users. So how do we fix that? So I'm just going to disconnect. I'm going to disconnect dash MG graph is a really cool command just to bin the existing um, token, the session. I'm now going to connect again with a different scope, users.readall. That's going to allow me to read um, Barry's account only if I have permission to read Barry's account in the directory, which I do. So I'm going to reconnect to the graph. It's going to sign me in. It's saying, hey, Ben, um, do you give this application permission to read all users' profiles? It's like, yeah, go on then. Let's allow that. So then when I jump back in here and I've been authenticated, you'll get this welcome message by default. You can suppress that. I'm just going to say get MG user Barry. And there you go. So it's brought back Barry now. So you can see I'm, I'm gradually increasing the scopes as I need to to get the data I need. Um, there's some code samples in here available on GitHub and the link is in the Zoom resources. Um, if you would just want to remove all of the delegated permissions from the different applications you're using in your tenant, here's a really cool code sample. Um, this will, um, as long as the user running this has got permissions um, to do these things, it will go through the different applications and remove the delegated permissions from them for the user objects you've defined. So I'm not going to run that now. I'm just going to call that out. That's pretty cool code to look at. Um, so we've looked at connecting to the graph interactively. Yeah, so um, I've had to authorize that. Um, it, it happened in the browser. I had to MFA to it. Um, there's another way um, using device code flow. Um, connecting to the Microsoft graph using device code flow is useful for devices that don't have keyboards. So it could be a TV, could be a screen in an airport. Um, so if I run this, um, I've specified use device code switch. It's now giving me a code. So I'm just going to double click that, copy it to my clipboard and control click this link. And I say next. Because I'm already authenticated in this browser session as me, um, it's not asking me to re-authenticate because my JWT token's valid and it knows who I am. And um, But what it is asking me to do is um, you signing in via this client application. Is that you from the UK? And I'll say, yes, that's me. Are you trying to use Microsoft Graph command line tools, which is the SDK? And I say, yes, go and do your thing. Continue. And that's done. So yeah, welcome to Microsoft Graph. So I've connected. If I do get MG context now, and I just want to pull back um, one of those properties, um, you can see I've actually connected with the device code credential type. So that's pretty cool to connect that way. Um, if I do get my ID again, I can do that. Because even though I've used the device code flow, it's my user who's granted that authentication using device code. So I've still got access to my data. Okay, so um, as you start doing more programming, um, I would strongly suggest you do not use the enterprise applications that exist. So the enterprise application for Graph Explorer, the enterprise application for the Graph SDK. Um, Dan called out earlier, which is a really good shout. Some some of you who've been maybe doing some automation for a while may have been using an old app, an old service principle in your tenant, um, and you might find that if you go and do some old code, it doesn't work anymore because the application registration you're using no longer exists. 
So there was an Intune PowerShell application that was in the tenant that was deprecated in April this year. Um, if you look out for, I think I've got the, um, I think I've still got it in my tenant actually, the service principle still there. Let's show you that real quick. So if we look for, yeah, Microsoft Intune PowerShell. So the service principle is still in my tenant. It's not going to do anything. Um, this is the application ID. So if you see this application ID in any of your code, you know that that's not going to work. You need to create your own app registration um, to communicate with the graph. And that's what we're going to look at next. How are we doing for questions? Am I still good to carry on? Or do we want to pull um, and answer anything? There's some that we can definitely kind of address, I think. Um, maybe even at a high level, just because they're interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, we're kind of getting to the point where we've run a couple of queries. They're a little bit obfuscated from us, but get mg user dash user ID Ben at byte Ben. Uh, somebody asked, can you explain briefly how O data filters work? Uh, yeah, I mean, o, how it happens on the on the service side is a little bit kind of crazy, but uh, O data itself is a standard. Uh, I can put it in the chat. And maybe we can get it added to the resources. So uh, you know, Microsoft did not invent this and, and say, hey, everybody is doing this. They're following the OData standard, which kind of breaks up the URL into different parts. And then there are some standards on what that looks like um, in the URI. So if you're dealing with key value pairs, they have to look like this. If you're dealing with order by or skip or filter, all those, there's some standards. Um, so the, the nice part is they all look similar. Uh, but where things can get a little bit weird is that uh, it's on the service side to support that. Um, there are some advantages to OData in that you just you kind of get some given to you by default. Uh, if you implement on the back end kind of your OData standard, uh, some of those things are just going to automatically work every time you stand up an endpoint. But other things aren't, and you're going to have to actually implement them. But uh, yeah, uh, you know, there, there's a basic doc on on all the OData standard itself. Um, on the back side, that dash user ID is probably doing something like dollar filter equals and then username EQ Bennett byte Ben. Right? And it's it's doing it for you on the back end. That the SDK is doing some of the heavy lifting for you and constructing filters. Just like uh, you know, when you're doing a lot of other things, whether it's like your AD commandlets, um, we're just obfuscating it. You know, we're we're taking a step back and giving you something simple. Um I know one thing that's come up a couple of times in a couple of different ways is um, running. The, we've done a lot of interactive stuff here. We're going to move towards some non-interactive stuff as we go through here a little bit, whether that's managed identities or certificate-based auth, some things that lend themselves more towards non-interactive. So yeah, that will get addressed as we go. Uh, don't want to curtail right into it because there's a little bit more content, but it is a thing. We will show that. Um yeah, and I, I saw some questions around reporting on, because we've mentioned highly privileged, right? There's some risk here. Um, I don't know offhand, and maybe Ben does, if there is a report on these uh, types of permissions. But one thing I do know is that you can um, query for them. You can filter for uh, who's using them. So the uh, and there's a couple of different types of sign-ins. When you're looking at your sign-in logs, you can go and check your sign-in events. And uh, there's actually non-interactive sign-in events is one of the big ones. I've just linked it in the chat as well. Um, so, you know, you can be mindful of the sign-ins that are happening non-interactively that are going to be using these app registrations uh, and leveraging permissions that have already been granted. So it can be, you know, part of your sort of access review to go and look at what the past month of non-interactive sign-ins look like. It's something that we've done here and we have caught um, cases where we're just like, well, why is that still authenticating? What is that? Um, you know, or you might find uh, sign-ins that are not using the type of authentication that you expect them to based on your policies, that sort of fun stuff. Um, yeah. So, yeah, sign yeah, it's a great shout out. Sign-in logs are a great place to start. Um, and also um, when we're talking about the app registration. So we're, we're, we're going to create an app registration now. I'm just very conscious of time. So I'm probably going to pick up the pace a little bit. Um, the really like looking at manifest is quite cool. So the manifest is basically how the app registration is created and the makeup of it and the permissions that have been um, granted. 
um, to it. So this is this is quite cool as a snapshot. You can call this stuff out from graph and review it um, so to see who's been assigned what and what roles have been granted. Um, but really what, we, what we're moving to now is we're using our own app registration. And the reason we want to do that is because we want to maybe give more granular control over who can access this specific app that does this specific thing um, with our data. You might have multiple app registrations you want to create because they do different things. And you want to assign different users to the different apps that do different things. So um, while, while the, the existing service principles are okay, like the Graph Explorer and the SDK service principles that exist, they're okay to test on. Um, but as you move to production, I would strongly suggest you use your, create your own app registration to do the calls um, for authentication and authorization. So we've we've created an example here, Patch My PC webinar. Um, we've just created an app registration, done nothing special. All I've done is got the client ID. You can see there's no permissions defined on this at all. So this app's got no permission to do anything. And the only thing we've configured on it, um, which you'll need to do if you're using the SDK, is to grant a um, reply URI. So redirect URI, sorry. So the SDK must have um, HTTP local host. Um, we we caught this during testing, didn't we, Cody? Hey, we MSL listens on this. And we can probably show yeah. show this as we do the next code snippet. I think so. And if I can as well, if it doesn't come up here. So I'm, I'm going to just call out these variables here. So this is the ID for the application that you've just seen in Entra. And that's my tenant ID. Um, we've called out in this code snippet that we need to have that redirect URI. I'm going to disconnect my previous graph session. And then I'm, instead of using an interactive flow, I'm actually going to specify client ID and tenant ID. And now I'm authenticating via my own application. So I need to grant permissions for this app to do some things. And I can close that. No, I didn't want to close that. I wanted to show what was in the address bar. Yeah, you're too fast. Dude. Sorry, I should run into it too if we got time for when I do it. So I'm going to authenticate. Here we go. So why do we need to add a redirect URI to local host? Because something's listening for it. <laughs> On a device you're connecting from. Did you ever did you ever run NetStack? Could you see that listener? I didn't take the time to no no so uh it is kind of interesting yeah when you when you do this though when you're running it um you're you're creating uh the actual client itself locally um uh, so I'll show some of the SDK code here and and you're actually creating something that's that's running and it and it binds to a port and it's listening and so your browser then can actually talk to it and then they have a local secure connection uh, where they can chat in between with each other. Uh, so that lets you go off to the browser, even though that's not where anything is actually happening. You know, we, we talked a little bit about device code authentication, which we'll, we'll try to show. Um, and, and that's separating things out a little bit, right? I'm, I'm going to give you a little bit of information here, and I don't really care where you provide it. Uh, but when we're doing that interactive authentication session, that all has to happen locally. You're creating something locally that's listening, and then you have to be able to get to it. You have to be able to talk to that local host port which isn't exposed externally. Um, so just it's different ways that they've actually uh, exposed credentials and authentication over time, uh, whether it's device code or local or some silent token acquisition, that sort of thing. Cool. Cool, cool. So um, now we're going to show like using a client secret. So um, we're not going to be authenticating on behalf of the user or trying to do stuff on behalf of the user. We're going to actually use the identity of of its own identity, its own service principle to make call to the graph. Um, so we we first of all, and you've maybe come across this before, when you've got an app registration, you can create certificates um, and use those for authentication, um, or you can create secrets. So we can, we can create a client secret. I created one earlier and I've saved it in a variable in my code just to make it, things easier. So when I go to VS Code, um, I'm basically calling out my client ID, my tenant ID. Um, I'm creating a secure credential um, from that secret. And I'm going to use that to connect. So I'm going to disconnect from graph. And then I'm going to connect using the client credential. So I'm going to use the client secret credential, which contains um, the client ID and the secret for that client ID. So if I make that connection, um, there's been no browser redirect um, because the application's being authenticated on its own right, I guess. And if I do get ng context, 
you can see now that it's the auth type is app only and it's connected via client secret. So this gets a bit more interesting when you look at automation, even though you shouldn't use secrets. Um, and secrets, I've got a secret in this code and I had to remember to remove it before I shared the sample. Like secrets can just leak. <laughs> so I'm not a huge fan of them. I'm like, okay with secrets if they're in a key vault and you call them from a key vault. Sometimes there's scenarios where you must do that and you can't use a managed identity. But on the whole, um, you really want to maybe start trying to use certificates for authentication. Um, but what we want to show now is the application has now authenticated, um, but can the application access Ben at ByteBen.com? And the answer is no, because I actually need to explicitly grant the application um, permission to go and access this. Okay, so by default, it's got no permissions. Um, I can do it in code or I'd have to go to API permissions on the app registration and add a permission. So if I add a permission for Microsoft Graph, I'm not using delegated flow. I'm using application permission flow now. So if I go for users.read, is it user? It's users. Where's the users gone? <laughs> Isn't it user dot read? I thought that was there. You go user dot user dot read or well, I don't know why my brain pluralized it. Um, so I've added the permission. The application expects this permission to be granted, and it's not. So I'm going to grant consent. And so now, if I try and do the same thing with the application again, so I'm going to have to disconnect and reconnect. So my new token, let's try again. And it's got the user. So I've explicitly granted consent for the application to go and do something in the graph. Okay, so certificates are much more interesting. Um, I'm going to really zip over this because time is really ticking now. But essentially, here's some, some basic code to create a certificate for authentication. Like we just need a public key and a private key. And so we hold the private key. We need to upload the public key portion to the app registration. So I'm just, I'm just going to run this code real quick. Um, so we're going to create a new certificate. I'm going to mark it as exportable. Um, if it doesn't need to be exportable, don't mark it as exportable. Um, I'm, I'm going to want to use this certificate in Azure Automation, so I want to export the private key so I can import it in the key vault. Um, but what I'm going to do now is just export the public key for this certificate onto this device into a folder. Um, um, let me just export the PFX while I'm here as well. And this will be a way to set up non-interactive auth, right? So a certificate is effectively, a, a, you know, you can authenticate with it. It's as good as a password, um, assuming that cert's trusted for that purpose. So you create this, you set it up, associate it with that app registration. Uh, you can store that certificate in the vault uh, and then at that point, it's on you to grant the thing access to the vault. So maybe you've got a managed identity that's being used or certain whatever in your Azure automation run books. Uh, that's going to have access to the vault. The vault contains the cert. You've got, you know, end to end, uh, unattended, non-interactive automation. So certificates is definitely a good, a good option there. 100%. So this, this code is just, is created a certificate in my user store. Um, I've also that code snippet, which uh, I'm not going to step through because we're really short on time. Um, I've got the public portion of the certificate here. Um, and I've also got the PFX if I want to import that into Azure Automation or Key Vault. So I'm going to grab this one now and just add this to my app registration real quick. So go back to certificates and secrets, um, upload a certificate. So I need the public key, which is in that folder, and say add. So there's my certificate I added today. So now let's try and authenticate with it. So I've already got the certificate in a variable um, in my VS Code session. So I, with the Graph SDK, I can either choose to connect, I can use the whole certificate blob to make the connection, or I can specifically use the thumbprint or the subject. So it doesn't matter which you use. So I'm going to use this one. It made the connection to Graph. If I get MG context, you can see that here's the full certificate blob that was used to authenticate. 
and it tells you that the token credential type was client certificate. So this client certificate is a much better way to make that connection. Even if you're doing testing, in my opinion, you don't have secrets floating about everywhere. <clears throat> okay, so um, we're approaching the end of some of the code examples. Um, that's really a good way how to authenticate. If you're starting to use more advanced stuff in, in Azure, so you've got automation accounts, we can still use the SDK. So let me flip over real quick and show you, I've got an automation account in my tenant. Um, and I just want to talk through this real quickly. So I'm going to call out the runtime version um, of this account straight away. So I'm running 5.1. Um, what I want to do is get the graph SDK modules um, into this automation account. So if I go back a step here and go down to modules, you want to add a module and browse from the gallery and just search for graph. <clears throat> so in my examples I've used today, I've used Microsoft.graph.authentication and Microsoft.graph.users. I really don't want to be pulling the whole SDK into my automation account. It's going to take forever to load. So I've just got these two um, small modules. Um, what I've also done, um, with an automation account, you can call a credential from a key vault, or you can actually upload it as a resource. So on this automation account, I've uploaded the private key um, here. So, so there's the private key. Um, so when I make a call for one of my run books, uh, if I find one of my run books here, I've got two with this account. The first one, if I edit in the portal, so very simple code. Um, it's get it's going to get an automation certificate, which is a resource um, on this run book. You can see it here down the side. It's got the private key. I'm going to use the same app registration I've used in the previous samples, and I'm just going to do connect mg graph, um, and then I'm going to run a command get Barry get the context and get Barry. So if I run this in test pane, um, let's see if that works. <clears throat> While that's running, like um, I really, there are probably some edge cases using the SDK for authentication from an automation account. You're probably going to want to use a managed identity. It's much simpler. And if we've got time, we will do some managed identity stuff, but we are definitely ticking. Wow, this kind of loads. I, I've seen a few kind of follow-up questions, you know, about like identifying highly privileged uh, app registrations and things like that. Uh, I, I really don't know that there's anything in your face native for a report. What I do know is that data is there. Um, poking around a little bit, I mean, I do see some community samples out there, but I don't, I'm not going to run them and suggest them right now. But definitely there are some commandlets like get dash mg service principle that are going to help you go find these service principles. And then you could see the list of permissions. And it's up to you to then define what is a high priority permission enumerate through those, maybe generate some, you know, reports. You could re use Azure automation uh, to, to do this, right? And you could you could set up some scheduled thing that's running and gets your list of all your service principles, uh, has a list of things that are highly privileged and kicks out your report. Um, so yeah, I don't, surprisingly, I don't think there's anything available um, in terms of, of actually here's a report, but you could get that data and also you could regularly review your sign-in logs. Really good advice. Yeah, definitely. If, if you're concerned that you've, you've got a very over-permissive admin environment, um, maybe you've only just really implemented RBAC and there's a lot of historic permissions being granted. Um, you just need like application administrator um, permissions or higher to, to start granting consent to apps. So it's definitely worth, I'd definitely do it. Um, if I was moving to a new role in a new company, I'd probably want to see what the past person's done. Um, yeah, great call out. So this 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 runbook ran and it brought back some stuff. The second runbook um, is another example of using the SDK. So what this one's going to do, instead of um, using a credential on the actual resource itself, I'm not going to use it this time. Um, I'm going to use I'm going to connect and get a token using the identity, the managed identity um, of this runbook. Then I'm going to connect to Azure Key Vault. So I've got a certificate and a Key Vault. So that's my Key Vault name. That's the name of the certificate. 
I'm going to put it back as an X509 blob. And I'm going to connect using the same app registration um, using ConnectMG graph. This feels a bit weird. Like if I was going to do anything with my automation account, I'd just use the managed identity and I'd grant the managed identity permissions to do things on my resource. This is just an example, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a bit of fun. There are some edge cases. Yeah. So if you're running some automation, um, maybe somebody doesn't have a multi-tenant app and you want to do some authentication um, in a different tenant and you want to maybe grab a certificate or a secret from the key vault, that might be, yeah. So if you're doing stuff outside of your tenant, that could be valid. Um, I'm not going to run this because they take a little while to load, but this is just a good code example of another way to do it. Okay, and then, um, yeah, that's the key vault code. So really like like day-to-day -day stuff, we're wrapping up now. Um, like how do you use the, the Graph SDK day-to-day? -day? Um, well, you can install some more modules. So if you're working with Intune, this is probably a module you want to install, Graph Devices Corporate Management. Um, and we can do some cool stuff like um, we can connect. Let me Let me just do another connection, make sure I've got the right token. We can do things like get MG device app management mobile app. <laughs> Those wonderfully some, long generated names. Some of these SDK um, commandments are huge. It's like, man, you'll never remember those. Um, so I'm not authorized to connect for some reason. Oh, I haven't given the permission for the application. That's why. Um, I need to give the application consent. This is good. This was done on purpose. So I need to go to the app and I need to go to the API permission and I need to add, I need to give this app permission to go and do some stuff with apps. There we go. And then I'm going to consent for that permission. Cool. So if I go back to my code sample now and run the same command, uh, let me get a new token. because this token isn't authorized to do that. So it's pulled back 364 apps using that commander. It's like, okay. Um, and then you just start digging into it and playing with it, really. It's good fun. So we can use the same command that we can add a filter. So I'm going to look for Win32 line of business apps and just measure how many of those are in my tenant. So that's cool. So that's now brought that figure down to 70. So they must be like a ton of iOS apps and Android apps. Um, you can do stuff like using filters. You can sort the results. You can select like the first 10 results and pull those back only, um, which is a pretty cool thing to do. You can do some other stuff like, uh, because this is being pulled back the SD by the SDK, it can actually be pulled back as a PowerShell object. So you can do some where object um, filtering on it too. So I'm going to say like, Let's just pull back all the Win32 apps we have and let's just show the Microsoft ones. And um, there we go. So it's displaying all the Microsoft apps in my tenant. Well, that's cool. Um, then we can move on to some other stuff, like if we want to start patching some stuff. Um, so I'm going to use get MG device app management mobile app <laughs> command that again. So I'm going to get an app called CM trace in my tenant and pull it into a variable called dollar app. So if I look at this application, I'm going to change a couple of things just for give you an example of what you can do. Um, so there's there's my application I've just pulled back. Um, so I'm going to do a couple of cool things like I'm going to change the return code. So I'm going to I'm going to say zero does a hard reboot because I'm I'm nasty like that. I'm also going to change the name so. Again, the SDK has pulled this back as a PowerShell object. I'm just going to update the display name part of the object. So if I actually run, um, see what dollar app brings back. So it's brought back all these different properties. Um, I'm just going to update the display name property. Call it patch my PC webinar app. The app formerly known as CM trace. <clears throat> um, so I've changed it. I'm just going to create my JSON payload now to update. Um, so I'm just going to include the, the, because I'm doing a patch, I'm just going to include the property I've changed. So if we run this and just have a look at what that JSON payload looks like, um, there you go. It's just a very simple, so a patch command is just going to change this one property. 
So we're now going to use the update MG device app management mobile app commander. And we're going to throw that JSON um, as a body parameter. So when we jump back to Intune now, just do a quick refresh. And you're going to see JSON a lot when you're yeah, dealing yeah. with APIs in general. Uh, yeah. You know, it's just a format that has been generally decided on. You don't have to use it. Like the depends on the service, right? A service can totally accept something else. There's a header that you can set for content type that tell it what it is. But graph, it's 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 JSON. Uh, and it's can be a little bit, I don't know, daunting in a way. It's some other file structure. Maybe you already have uh, XML or or YAML or who knows what already engraved in your brain. But uh, <laughs> yeah, JSON's its own thing. Um, PowerShell has a lot of commandlets that help with it. We're using some. There's convert to JSON. There's convert from JSON. Um, it does a really good job of handling it for you. These graph commandlets also do a good job of handling it for you in a lot of cases. Uh, and then also the invoke rest method does a good job of handling it for you. Uh, it will automatically deserialize JSON payloads when they get returned to. So it doesn't have to be daunting. A lot of the work can get done for you. 100%. Yeah. Learn JSON. Um, it's important. You need to consider it because when you start putting back JSON bodies and, you know, you start doing some conversion, you don't quite get the results you're expecting. The depth does matter. So it's, it is definitely a good topic, um, to learn. In this example, like same thing, I'm just going to call the app into a variable. Um, I'm going to look for return code zero. Um, I'm going to change the, the type to hard reboot. Um, and then I'm just going to iterate through all the return codes on that Win32 app. Um, now I've modified that to hard reboot. Again, I'm just going to create my JSON payload, uh, which contains all of the return codes, including the one I've modified. And I'm just going to throw it up using update mm. ng device app management mobile app. So and since we... it's there and we've taken it for granted and it's come up, I know we mentioned O data and we've mentioned filtering and we've actually done some of those is of filters. Uh, these all come together, the pieces of the puzzle and the standards all come together. You know, we see we have that that O data dot type uh, field in there, and then we have filtering we've done of is of. That's all just part of the standard. Um, so O data says, hey, you as part of the schema for your JSON, you've got that O data dot type property, and then when you do a filter, you can do is of, and that's supposed to handle all of that filtering and return back only those object types. Hundred um, percent. Just one more thing for me. Then we, you're going to show some cool stuff, Cody. Couple things, yeah, nothing crazy. I think we got time. Um, sure. I want to call out like the SDK is is cool, like. It does abstract complexity away. There may be some commands where you still just want to do, like, I'm used to invoke REST method, and but I have to mess with tokens, and that annoys me. Well, in the Graph SDK, there is a command that called um, invoke MG Graph request, which is essentially doing what invoke REST method does, or invoke um, web request. So we can do some cool stuff here. So let me just disconnect and reconnect. So I can do invoke. Um, mg graph request and just point it to the endpoint um, and it's going to bring bring back some data for me which is pretty cool so i don't have to use the command that's in the sdk this is a really cool one i use this a lot um yeah the one thing i'm not going to go through this now but there's some code in here and i've put it in there so go and play with this but just be cautious because sometimes you'll use an sdk and in this code example what i've tried to show is if I use invoke um, mg graph request, which is like invoke rest method, I can specify one filter is of type win32 LAB apps. If I then use the SDK commands to get the same thing with the same filter, I could get different results come back. And we saw this in testing. So the invoke rest method um, didn't pull back the new enterprise apps from Microsoft catalog, whereas the SDK did. So that's just one thing to think about. Yeah, um, if you're not getting back the data you expect, um, maybe if you're using invoke mg graph request, you need to just refine your filters. Just a good thing to call out. Um, there could be some other stuff. Like here's the last example. Um, I'm going to make a connection now and just pull back all the apps to begin with 7-zip. Um, I don't think it's I'm going at you. Forbidden. Not authorized. Uh-oh. Not authorized. Uh... I'm going to skip this because I really want people to see the stuff you've got as well, but yeah. Uh... yeah. There, there's an example like um, using invoke MG graph request to pull back images. 
and um that's pretty that's pretty cool um but I yeah will let's, say um, some of the uh uris that he has here with that filtering um you know if you've done some powershell you might have heard the term filter left that applies here too so anything you can put to the left of the pipe you know we've done some where object filtering or we've done some looping after the fact anything you can put to the left puts the load on the server uh, and and I'm, I'm sure we all want to, you know, make the the servers that Microsoft is running continue to boil more than they already do. So if you can put it to the left of that where object, if you can put it in your URL, that's on Microsoft to filter it and give it back. Uh, and it's also going to get you back the results faster. So there are even some cases where um, they've got certain endpoints that like run reports on the back end. And you can specify a set of properties and you're reducing the amount of time it's going to take for your requests to get to you. So um, learning the filtering, the sorting, the ordering, the expanding, all of that can be pretty helpful. It has its own set of nuances. Cool. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to just, I've seen a question. Um, can you show me the mm -hmm. manager identity? I'm going to show that real quick. Go for uh, it. Just one last thing, really, like I've skipped over this code. Um, the, the SDK is really good at handling pagination as well. So when you make a request, to a resource in graph and there's a maximum number of results that will come back per page the sdk handles that really well and so this snippet um is just shows you like the sdk bringing back some results and how you would do that manually and paginate through results using um the invoke mg graph request instead so that's pretty cool um so the managed identity test um this this whole demo has been running on a vm in azure this VM has a managed identity, a system assigned managed identity. I've given this VM permissions to do things. Um, so this VM has a service principle. Um, it can do stuff in my tenant. And so what I'm going to do now is just run some code here where using the managed identity. So I'm going to connect to the Azure Instance Metadata Service Endpoint to get a token. So I'm not using the Graph SDK to get a token. So I'm just going to run this real quick just to get a token. And, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to send use invoke MG graph request. So I will use the SDK for that. So I'm going to connect to a key vault in my tenant and I'm going to pull back a secret and I'm going to show you the value of that secret. Cool. <laughs> there you go. The moon is a spaceship. So there's the, the managed identity, this virtual machine has done that thing. And it doesn't have to be a virtual machine, you know, um, I don't, I'm not brave enough to say what percentage of resources in Azure actually have a managed system assigned managed identity. Um, maybe all of them, maybe 99%. Um, but yeah, managed identities are definitely the way to go. That might be a good next, a webinar to do, just looking at managed identities and Azure resources. Um, yeah. yeah. Somebody specifically asked for that. So I thought I'd just show it. But maybe Cody, you can share and talk about like this whole thing. I can do some talking while you, or you share out or stop my share. Sure. Like this whole webinar is really born for the fact that a lot of us use the MSL PS module. Um, you don't have to, you can just use invoke rest method. You can get tokens other ways, but you know, we've got a love for MSL. Um, even though the PowerShell model is deprecated, MSL.net is still a thing. And I think Cody, you were going to show some examples. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I just have VS code up here in light mode. Uh, just in case. And so with here though, I'm going to do something kind of interesting. Um, I'm, I'm going to use a DLL from a, a NuGet package. So um, in this folder, all I really have is a quick little script. There's just some snippets in here. Uh, what I'm actually going to do is make a whole new .NET app. Uh, this is a, as quick as that, just .NET new console app. I've actually made an entire hello world application. Um, you know, it's got a CS proj file that defines what framework and, and all that fun stuff that just gets auto-generated and we take for granted. Uh, but the reason I'm doing this is I can leverage sort of the existing bits and pieces and framework that we have for NuGet packages. So I've created this project and then I've actually added a NuGet package, .NET add package Microsoft.identity.client. This is the MSOL library in .NET. Uh, so if you're using C Sharp or VB.NET or some other .NET supported language, then you could add this package and start interacting with MSOL. Uh, so what I'm going to go ahead and do is build this. 
And when I build that, I should actually get in my bin folder now, I should see that DLL. No, I don't want to open it. But I have Microsoft.identity.client.dll. So I have a file now. Uh, I think we did a little bit of add type previously. Uh, I'm, I'm leveraging existing DLLs here. Add type, you point to it. Um, this is a Microsoft redistributable um, as part of a NuGet package. Um, so use cases, it kind of depends what you're doing here. Uh, but the point being, I can do something very similar to what we've been doing with our SDK for PowerShell. Uh, I'm using the SDK for .NET. I'm just exposing it through PowerShell because you know they're, they're very interoperable. So what I'm going to do here is create something kind of similar to when you're getting that graph connection going. They they just call them client app builders. So I'm going to take this class, Microsoft Identity Client. Uh, I've got a client ID very similar to what we're already doing. You know, you're pointing at something, and then I'm telling it where to go. These are all parameters that we had before, uh, but it's going to give me something I can actually interact with. So I now have a public client app. And this has a bunch of methods on it, uh, if we look, a bunch of fun ones. So you can look at all the different like acquire options. And many of these are just different ways of exposing, like when you do connect MD MG graph, if you look at all the options, you get a bunch of them. Um, but there's some interesting ones that uh, you know, acquire token async is pretty straightforward. Um, it makes a couple of different attempts. Usually I'm calling Fire Token interactive at first. I want to prompt the user. I want to get that information. But even that has a couple of different options to it. Um, but we'll start with that. So scopes are still defined. Uh, we've got that default. We've talked about and shown that one uh, a little bit. And then uh, we'll go ahead and snag. I'm going to authenticate. So we can see that it popped up a window pretty similar to what we've been doing. Authentication complete. We can also see that localhost. So this localhost 61557, like Ben had shown before, that, that is this. This is listening. This builder, this client app is effectively, it's a it's bound to a port and it is able to listen. Uh, and I, I, have, I have a token. Uh, there is the expiration date for that token. Uh, now, what's interesting is once you have that, it's in a cache. So you can see these tokens, or rather you can see the accounts that are in the token, the cache. So I have my public client app that we created earlier. I can now call get accounts and I can actually see these tokens. Uh, so one of the other options on that was acquire token silent. Uh, you can request to go ahead and get the token again if it exists. So I'm able to now grab that result and without even being prompted, I didn't have another browser window pop up or anything. It checks the token cache and gives you back an existing token. And we can see that there's some scopes that have been granted there and all that fun stuff. Um, and then you can do the same calls. Um, there is a nice little method on those results uh, for create authorization header. And it's going to give you the actual token in a format that you can use, like a bearer token, which is nice. Um, and also, on top of that, there are some options I think I mentioned when you're calling these. So it's up to you what you actually call. Um, there you can actually force re uh, and interactive actually is the one I wanted to show you. Yeah, there we go. So there's a few different things you can do. Uh, you know, there are, uh, for example, with prompt, you can change what the actual prompt should be. You can, you can force them to log in. You can have it auto select. Uh, we can see the type that it takes. So anything that is in here, whether it's consent, no prompt, forced login, select account. So, I mean, I can grab no prompt, for example. And what that will actually do Mm -hmm. If I can get my call to acquire token interactive. Ah, uh, one too many. There we go. So it popped up the window, but I didn't have to select an account. 
uh, it automatically based on the one that's logged in and you've and it's got that little signed in as it automatically just snagged it it's not even going to prompt you so you can play with some of these different options and if you start to dig in more there's some logging x things you can um, add in there to have your own logger for all of the authentication things which can be really helpful uh, for troubleshooting uh, there, there, there's a whole list of of things you can do once you actually have these um, but you're really just using the SDK in a different way. And then you're getting your token. I mean, you have this token. And I think one nice part that Ben um, had showed or mentioned was you can use these anywhere. Once you have the token, um, you know, I could go if I wanted and and make a, uh, a graph request in like Postman or something. And there is going to be, that'll be perfectly function, functional. We only grab like my access token here. I have Postman pulled up. If you've never seen it, uh, it's a web UI, and I think there's a tool locally. It lets you make post uh, REST calls. So this is that URI, like we've been seeing. You can slash beta in this case. Um, I'm doing a get request. I'm going to go ahead and actually add some authorization and dump in a token here. Uh, and then I do have some headers, but nothing excessive. I'm pretty sure it's pretty much all defaults. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. Oh, there's a hard return in there, isn't there? There always is. Yeah, there we go. Hey, and there we go. We have my object uh, in a JSON format that is my user as me. I use my token that I got from MSOL and I made a graph call somewhere uh, and it can auth I was able to get authorized. So there's a lot of flexibility. There's a lot of ways to get these tokens. Uh, you know, they, they've taken away some things, but there are also some alternatives. Uh, you know, we, we actively use these libraries for for lots of things. They've got some uses even outside of um, you know, directly make, interacting with Microsoft. Uh, there, there's some other methods you'll find in here that are good for some other stuff in terms of like serializing um, tokens and stuff. So yeah, a little bit off the beaten path, but I think interesting and, and related for sure. Yeah, definitely. Like um, MSL's still around. It's just a PowerShell um, SDK that's gone, the PowerShell module, sorry. Um, so MSL is still a thing, absolutely. So it's great that it's still alive and um, that we can still use it in code if we want to, to get tokens. Yeah, for sure. Um, One of the uh, questions that we do have sitting there is, is it, uh, and I think it it plays into to the direction that this presentation really had ended up heading. Is it possible to combine REST API calls and PowerShell commandlet slash SDK in the same script? The answer is yes. Uh, I, I think... One of the reasons you're seeing a lot of authentication discussion here uh, as it relates to you know the the, the deprecation of the, that module uh, is that authentication is one of the biggest components of all of this. You just need to be able to, to have permission to do the stuff. The stuff you do has not changed, uh, right? All of the graph uh, things you do have not changed. The objects haven't changed. The endpoints you hit haven't changed. Um, they've just made it a little bit more, uh, well, not difficult, but they've changed the way you authenticate, which can really throw a wrench in things. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, once you've got a token, it's fair game. Make whatever you call via whatever mechanism you want. You can go call a Go library that hits the, it doesn't matter. There was a ton of content to go through and um, we, we covered a lot of areas. We did focus heavily on authentication and enterprise app security and service principles and scopes and um, hopefully that was useful. Um, it was enjoyable to do the research for this, um, look at different code samples. It was nice to spend some time in the SDK. Um, I'd probably use it more than I used to before. I think I'm still a fan of invoke rest method personally. Um, but yeah, there is definitely a place for the SDK 100%. Um, this is probably, this is, um, this is like new for us to do a webinar where we focus on like a specific technology and not necessarily patch my pc products like we're still committed to do webinars on our own products and we'll absolutely continue to do that um, but it'd be cool to get some feedback whether it's on twitter linkedin facebook and all those social media channels like if you enjoyed this or if you've got any ideas for some more content you'd like to see definitely let us know but yeah thanks for everybody backstage as well supporting the webinar and thanks cody for joining as well and helping with it it was great fun yeah, yeah take care Thank you.